Thank you. We now turn to topical questions. We start with question number one from Anas Sarwa. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start with you by being the biggest sook in the chamber by wishing you a happy new year and also everyone else uh, around the chamber. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports of an increase in the number of people dying in hospital while waiting to be discharged because their care package had yet to be finalised. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Well, firstly, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all health and social care staff across Scotland for their hard work and dedication to the care of our old and vulnerable people over the winter period. I am, of course, saddened to hear of any patient dying whilst waiting to return home. No one should have to wait unnecessarily in hospital once they are fit for discharge. This is particularly important for people nearing the end of their life, as we know most people would prefer to die at home or in a homely setting. And that's why we have committed within our health and social care, del social care delivery plan to double the palliative end of life provision within the community by 2021. This will help to ensure that those nearing end of life will get the care they need in the right place at the right time. I am also committed to eradicating delays and that's why we recently announced an additional £107 million to support sustainability in the care sector. This brings the NHS contribution to enhancing social care to around £500 million a year. My officials have been in regular contact with those partnerships facing the most significant challenges and I'm assured that they've seen a great deal of progress in the lead up to and over the festive period, ensuring people got home and also freeing up much needed beds over the winter period. First of all, join the Cabinet Secretary in paying tribute to all our amazing NHS staff who go above and beyond to care for others. Uh, presenting Officer, freedom of information requests from Scottish Labour reveal that since uh, the Cabinet Secretary made the commitment to eradicate delayed discharge. At least 683 patients in Scotland have died in hospital as a delayed discharge. Figures are actually expected to be much higher as some health boards were unable to reveal figures. Official figures also show that the NHS loses around 45,000 bed days a month due to delayed discharge. The Cabinet Secretary has repeated the promise to eradicate delayed discharge again today, but the reality is this is yet another failure on her watch. A delayed discharge is identified as a hospital inpatient, judged clinically ready to leave hospital, who continues to occupy a bed beyond the ready for discharge date. These patients may be ready to return home or be transferred to a care home. Given the clear pressures on social care, why does the Cabinet Secretary support a further cut of £327 million to local councils this year, a figure confirmed by the Scottish Parliament Information Centre, SPICE. Instead, why won't she commit to use the powers of this parliament to stop the cuts? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, uh, Audit Scotland have highlighted the progress that has been made with a 9% year-on-year reduction in bed days associated with delays in 2015-16. Progress made, but I am, as I've said before in this chamber, uh, the first to say that more progress has to be made, which is why, of course, it's important that all partnerships uh, make uh, tackling delayed discharge a key priority. And that's why, of course, in the draft budget for 2017-18, there is a further £107 million allocated to be transferred from the NHS to integration authorities. That's in addition to the £250 million transfer in 2016-17, which is now baselined. When adding to that the £100 million integrated care fund and the £30 million delayed discharge funding the NHS is contributing, that is around £500 million per year to support social care. I think that is uh, resources that is quite right uh, in an integrated system to help to tackle delay and of course is in direct contrast to elsewhere where we've seen uh, cuts uh, to social care budgets and fewer people getting the help that they need. If all partnerships in Scotland were performing at the best, uh, the rate of the, the top 25% in tackling delay, many of which have got into single figures in the number of delays over three days, then we would be able to half the number of delays uh, straight away. So the challenge is to work with partnerships, and my officials are doing that, to make sure that all of them are doing the things that we know work to help uh, eradicate delay out of the system. And that's our 
The Cabinet Secretary says that she understands the seriousness of these figures and indeed the seriousness of delayed discharge, but the reality is that Audit Scotland gave a damning indictment of the state of the NHS under her watch. And while the rhetoric is rich today, it doesn't match the reality for so many individuals who are struggling as a result of social care cuts at councils the length and breadth of the country. Because, presiding officer, behind each statistic is an individual and their family that have been let down and failed. Almost 700 patients going on to die in hospital as a delayed discharge since the Cabinet Secretary promised to eradicate it. This will be people's relatives and friends in this situation, where they were told that they were now clinically able to go home and ready for discharge, where they believed they were coming home to perhaps spend their final weeks and months at home with their own family, but instead trapped in hospital waiting for a care package, perhaps for weeks and months on end. But then they never came home at all, but instead went on to lose their lives in hospital. Will the Cabinet Secretary take this opportunity to apologise to all families let down by delayed discharge and to make a commitment that she will fight to reverse the cuts to social care packages and budgets across the country? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, uh, I do recognise that behind each statistic is a, a person, which is why I said in my initial answer that I'm saddened to hear of any patient dying whilst waiting to return home. No one should have to wait unnecessarily in hospital once they are fit for discharge, which is why we are putting half a billion pounds into tackling uh, this issue because it is one of the highest priorities for this government and for me as the Cabinet Secretary for Health. And of course, as I've said, progress is being made. 10 out of the 32 partnerships now have delayed discharge in single figures. That's delays over three days in single figures. What we need to see are the other 22 partnerships following suit. We know what works and that's why with the resources that have been given we expect all partnerships to make sure that they are putting in place the services that we know uh, make sure that people not only can get home out of hospital in a timely fashion but many of those services will prevent people going into hospital in the first place. So action being taken, some progress being made, the speed of that progress needs to increase which is why we're putting in the resources that we're putting in. Donald Cameron. <coughs> Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will also be aware that the most recently published figures show that delayed discharges cost the NHS £114 million in 2015-16. That approximates to £214 every single day. That is an utterly unacceptable loss of vital funding for our NHS. What will the Cabinet Secretary do to ensure that this kind of loss to NHS funding is not repeated this year and beyond? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, it is vitally important that all of the resources in the NHS and indeed in our health and care partnerships are used to best effect, which is why the resources that we've put in to tackle delayed discharge is also focused at making sure that the bed capacity in our acute, se uh, acute hospitals, in our acute sector and indeed our community hospitals, as is used for those patients who require to be in those beds and not for patients who are ready uh, for discharge. As I said in my previous answer, progress uh, is being made and of course the £500 million pounds that we've put in uh, is beginning to make a difference but we need to see more progress. What I would say uh, to the member is that is in direct contrast to the situation in, in England where for six consecutive years we've seen cuts to local authority budgets. Well, I would have thought, given that the Labour Party in England have only this week raised the same issue about Jeremy Hunt's stewardship of the National Health Service, where 26% fewer people get the help that they need. And I would just reflect on the Red Cross's description of the NHS as facing a humanitarian crisis. We may have our issues and our challenges here in Scotland, but the Red Cross here in Scotland are not describing NHS Scotland in those terms. Our health and care staff do a tremendous job. The resources are in place. We know what works. I would just hope perhaps the opposition might get behind them in their work that they are doing over the festive period and beyond, rather than criticising as they do from the sidelines. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Cabinet Secretary is aware that part of care packages often includes physiotherapy, particularly for the elderly. She will be aware that in NHS Ayrshire and Arden, waiting times for physiotherapy are now extending from 42 to 48 weeks following the alleged laying off of staff. 48 weeks waiting times for physiotherapy is little short of scandalous, Cabinet Secretary. Almost a year. What can she do about it to reduce the waiting times for physiotherapy for everyone in Ayrshire? Cabinet Secretary. Well, John Scott actually makes a, a very important point that in making sure that people can not only get home in a timely fashion, but in many cases avoid hospital admission in the first place, the role of our allied health professionals, including physiotherapists, is vitally important. Uh, now, I recently met with uh, physiotherapists um, and heard at first hand the very, very important work they are doing to keep people out of hospital and get them home in a timely fashion. And what I'm clear about is in taking forward the, the plans through the health and care partnerships, the role of our physiotherapists is very, very important in doing that. Now that, as part of our plan, our national workforce plan, which is uh, going to be uh, a very, very important part of ensuring we have the right professionals in the right Place. Work is going on in that at the moment and we'll be consulting with professional bodies including those representing physiotherapists. I think we will need more physiotherapists as part of that workforce plan to do the very thing that John Scott was talking about. Very happy, presiding officer, to keep John Scott informed about the work that we're going to be taking forward through the national workforce plan, particularly in relation to the growth of the physiotherapy workforce. Thank you. Question number two, Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for its response to the IPPR report equipping Scotland for the future. Minister Jamie Hepper. The report highlights many of the challenges identified within our economic and labour market strategies, which also formed part of the drivers for our decision to undertake the Enterprise and Skills Agency review, which is currently proceeding in partnership with stakeholders and the relevant agencies. A skilled workforce will be a key component of a more successful and inclusive economy in the years ahead. That's why our labour market strategy sets out who will put fairness at the heart of our drive to boost the economy, create jobs and remove barriers to the worker. The recently published second annual report on our youth employment strategy, development and young workforce, sets out the improvements being made in tandem with employers across the education system. And we are continuing to invest in our successful modern apprenticeship programme and are currently on target to achieve 26,000 new starts in 2016-17 as part of our target of 30,000 new starts by the last uh, year of this parliamentary session. And in our draft budget for 2017-18, we announced the establishment of, the establishment of a new £10 million workforce development fund to support the skills development of those already in work. Gillian Martin. Minister will be aware that the report outlines that youth employment rate in Scotland has been consistently higher than in the UK and that youth employment in Scotland is now at its lowest level since 2001. Could he outline what factors he believes have contributed towards this and how this trend will be sustained or indeed improved on? Minister. Well, of course, uh, President Officer, there has been a concerted effort made by uh, this administration to focus on the issue of youth unemployment. This was a, a particular issue of concern during the economic downturn, during which, of course, we were the first government in the UK to establish a Minister for Youth Employment, underlining our focus on the matter. There are, have been a range of initiatives in place uh, supporting improvements such as Community Jobs Scotland, that delivered in tandem with the SEVO. Uh, there's been other initiatives such as uh, Scotland's employer recruitment, recruitment incentive. And of course, we've increased the number of modern apprenticeships available uh, in the country. We'll continue to develop these initiatives, we'll continue to develop the developing the young workforce agenda to help us continue uh, to progress to reducing un youth unemployment by 40% from 2014 levels by 2021. Gillian Martin. So the Scottish Government is committed to growing our economy with a focus on more jobs and fair work. And I share that commitment. Can the Minister outline how he's making work fair in Scotland? Minister. Well, I again, uh, President Officer, this is uh, another important agenda for uh, the Government. We uh, support the work of the Fair Work Convention. Uh, fair work is writ through our uh, labour market strategy. Indeed, within that strategy, we uh, set out that we'll be providing funding for the Fair Work Convention to to roll out their Fair Work uh, framework. We, of course, have the Business Pledge, which contains a number of Fair Work commitments, with 299 uh, employers signed up to that uh, pledge. We have uh, support for the, the living wage. Of course, the administration, we uh, uh, pay at least the living wage to all of our 
uh, uh, employees. We uh, fund the Poverty Alliance for the accreditation scheme. We now have over 700 uh, employers accredited as living wage uh, employers. That might be, uh, help explain why we have some 80% of our workforce paid at least the living wage, the highest of uh, the four UK uh, nations. In modern apprenticeships, we have an Equalities Action Plan to uh, increase the numbers of those uh, underrepresented in uh, modern apprentice apprenticeships. And indeed, uh, we have other initiatives such as the Ruin Returner Scheme, uh, which we uh, funded Equate Scotland to take forward uh, this year. We'll continue to do all we can to make sure that we have a fair work culture here in Scotland. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Minister will be aware, according to figures released just yesterday, um, Scotland has an unemployment rate of 5.3%, above the UK rate of 4.8% for the whole of the UK. After 10 years of SNP government, does the Minister really think this underperformance is an acceptable position for the Scottish economy? Minister. Well, clearly we want, want to see continued improvements. What Mr Lockhart fails to uh, set out in his uh, question is that the unemployment rate uh, actually decreased in uh, the last year, and that is, of course, welcome, and we'll continue to do all we can to bring that uh, unemployment rate further down. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, one of the key points in the IPPR report is regarding technology change and automation. Indeed, some reports suggest as, mu uh, as much as 30 to 40 percent of the workforce could be made obsolete through, uh, through automation. Could the Minister confirm what the government's estimate of the potential impact uh, in Scotland is, over what sort of time frame, and what is the government's strategy uh, uh, with particular regard to the skills uh, regime about how to deal with this and how to make sure that those who find their jobs made obsolete find new work through reskilling? Minister. Well, I would caution against us talking about obsolete at this stage, but I recognise the point that Mr Johnson uh, makes. I would refer back to the labour market strategy where we explicitly uh, recognise the potential impact of increased uh, automation. Uh, I have been out and seen uh, many employers over the course of uh, some of where investment in technology, contrary to expectations, has actually led to an increase in uh, employment. But I recognise there is the uh, potential for it uh, to go uh, the other way. That's why we've set out the uh, area of concern within our labour market strategy and why we'll continue to have a, a focus in this area. Thank you. That concludes topical questions. We're now going to move on to the next item of business which is a debate in the name of Angela Constance on Scotland's place in the European Union. I'll just take two minutes to change seats.